lecture today is going to continue on the different vitamins and minerals that are working together to help to keep our immune system healthy and we're going to start with vitamin C. So getting enough vitamin C obviously is very important and as an adult we need for women 75 milligrams per day and for men 90 milligrams per day. However, because vitamin C, and we'll talk about this more later, is a good antioxidant, it is recommended that people who smoke need about an extra 35 milligrams per day to protect their lungs against oxidation. And the average American consumes about 70 to 100 milligrams per day, which is right up there with exactly what we need. Now, vitamin C is one of the water-soluble vitamins, and it is very important in helping us with wound healing because vitamin C is helpful in the formation of collagen and other types of connective tissue. And that connective tissue is going to help in building bones and help in keeping teeth in your mouth. Like for instance, the ligaments and tendons are made out of connective tissue. And so we use that connective tissue, those ligaments, to keep teeth anchored in the mouth. And of course, then also the connective tissue helps to hold blood vessels uh, together. It is a cofactor which assists several enzymes in being able to catalyze reactions. And it helps to synthesize something called carnitine. Now carnitine is a chemical that's very necessary for us because what it's doing is transporting fatty acids into the mitochondria. And we need those fatty acids going into the mitochondria in order to form ATP. Uh, it also helps to form two important hormones, which are serotonin and norepinephrine. As an antioxidant, it's also going to be able to react with vitamin E because um, what it does is it helps to uh, donate electrons to vitamin E and reactivates that vitamin after it's already donated its electrons to uh, some other chemical. Our best sources of vitamin E would, or excuse me, vitamin C are going to be citrus. And so that would be oranges, lemons, limes. And then there are some other types of fruits, like grapefruits also, uh, and even um, apples have some vitamin C. Potatoes have vitamin C, peppers, broccoli, green leafy vegetables, tomatoes, and cabbage. So vitamin C, it plays definitely a role in immune function, and what vitamin C is doing is it's helping to protect phagocytes. So phagocytes go through something called a respiratory burst. And the respiratory burst is the release of certain oxygen free radicals from these macrophages to help to degrade any internalized bacteria or fungi. So when a macrophage does this phagocytosis thing and brings into itself any kind of bacteria or fungi that's floating around in the body, then what's going to happen is the phagocyte is going to produce these reactive what we call oxygen species or these free radicals and it's going to help to kill whatever the pathogen is that the phagocyte actually uh, went through endocytosis to grab. Now the only problem is that these free radicals can cause problems in the phagocyte itself and potentially destroy the phagocyte. So vitamin C is there to donate its electrons and to then prevent the free radical from destroying the phagocyte. All right, so some more functions of vitamin C. Vitamin C also helps to promote uh, proliferation of other white blood cells and it does not prevent colds, okay? So what it's doing is because it's protecting those phagocytes and it's causing more white blood cell production, it's able to shorten the duration of a cold. So consuming a whole ton of vitamin C isn't necessarily going to help you when you have some type of cold. And a lot of people believe that it will. 
but instead what it's actually able to do is it's able to shorten the duration of us having a cold. Now when you consume excess amounts of vitamin C it's not going to be horrendously dangerous in comparison to consuming excess amounts of let's say fat soluble vitamins like A or E. If you have a water soluble vitamin it's going to actually uh, any excess will end up in the urine and you'll be able to flush that out of the system. If you have a fat soluble vitamin on the other hand excess does not end up in the urine excess is going to end up either storing in adipose tissue in the fat or some vitamins are going to end up storing in the liver and can cause damage. For instance, vitamin A, a lot of excess vitamin A, can cause a lot of neurological damage. Now, vitamin C also plays a role in absorption of iron, and it keeps iron in its most absorbable state, and anemic should then be able, or should actually consume much more vitamin C, and they should do it at the meal. So what they should be doing is mixing foods that contain iron with foods that contain vitamin C and eating those both at the same time. However, those with hemochromatosis, which is too much iron in the system, should not be doing that. Now, in the British Royal Navy, a big issue was a disease called scurvy. There was a doctor named James Lind who was studying scurvy and he printed a treatise on how to treat scurvy in 1754 and what he saw was that um, if you could give these sailors lime juice uh, then they wouldn't have this disease of scurvy and so scurvy uh, really fell off and people didn't have this issue anymore on ships uh, for 40 years because of this lime juice and this is why sailors were called limeys. Now one of the problems is for these sailors because they didn't have enough of the fresh produce, oranges and limes and so on, um, their connective tissue would start to fall apart and uh, scurvy that's what the issue is and so you see people where uh, their teeth are falling out, their gums are falling apart, they're bleeding a lot and uh, I'll show you some more in a little bit, but this is due to the lack of vitamin C. And nowadays you don't see scurvy as much because obviously it was happening on ships, but we do have people who have scurvy when um, you're looking at people who are really hardcore alcoholics. So they're drinking a liquid breakfast, liquid lunch, liquid dinner, and they're not really eating the nutrients they're supposed to, especially not nutrients containing vitamin C. So here are some of the things you would see with scurvy where you have the blood vessels breaking down the connective tissue and then you can see the swollen gums here and the teeth eventually starting to fall out because of the scurvy. So weakness, anemia, bruising, bleeding gums, poor wound healing, loose teeth, these are all symptoms of scurvy and they can occur as early as three months without enough vitamin C in the diet. So infantile scurvy is another big deal that we still see in the United States. It's found usually uh, in children that are 8 to 14 months of age and that happens in kids that are actually being fed pasteurized milk or boiled milk and that's because the heat is going to disrupt the vitamin C and so the symptoms appear about 4 to 10 months in uh, with deficiencies uh, and now one of the other big deals in these children is that they can develop what is called osteopenia now osteopenia is when your bones are weaker than normal okay uh, and what we see with a lot of children who have osteopenia uh, is where their uh, bones are going to be curved because they're soft and osteopenia can also be referred to as rickets now when the bones break that's more like osteoporosis this is just very soft bones 
So too much vitamin C um, isn't typically a problem, again, because this is a water-soluble vitamin and any of the excess ends up in the urine. Um, but there are some supplements that can have really high doses of vitamin C. And one of the issues is the more you ingest a vitamin C, the harder it is for you to be able to absorb that vitamin C. So absorption actually decreases. So for instance, uh, absorption decreases to 50% if you're consuming 1,000 milligrams of vitamin C a day. Or it decreases to 20% if uh, you're absorbing, or excuse me, if you're consuming 6,000 milligrams per day. So because you can't really absorb this vitamin C and it's flushing out through the intestinal tract, uh, it's also helping to create stomach inflammation and causing diarrhea when you're consuming too much. And the interesting thing is men who supplement with excess vitamin C are found to have greater risk of kidney stones. So here are just some uh, fruits and vegetables also that have vitamin C, bell peppers, strawberries, uh, grapefruit, pineapple, kiwi, oranges, broccoli, cauliflower, sweet potatoes, tomatoes. And so vitamin C excess, we know you don't want to have too much vitamin C, which enhances too much absorption of iron if a person has hemochromatosis. Uh, but the excess vitamin C can also create what are called oxalic, oxalate kidney stones, and uh, those are going to be very painful. Uh, the other interesting thing is it can also erode the enamel off of the teeth. So mo more food sources of our vitamin C. All right, so vitamin E, another fat-soluble vitamin, along with A, D, and K. Vitamin E has eight chemical forms that we can use. Uh, alpha, beta, gamma, delta, tocopherol. Alpha, beta, gamma, and delta, tocotrienol. Alpha, tocopherol is the only form that's recognized to meet human requirements. So some of the functions of vitamin C would be development of muscles, development of the central nervous system. Uh, it's used as a very powerful antioxidant for the body, and it helps to maintain nervous tissue and immune function. So vitamin E, as that powerful antioxidant, it is fat-soluble, which means we have vitamin E in the adipose tissue, we also have, interestingly enough, vitamin E in our cell membranes, and we'll talk about that. So lipids in our cell membranes can also be referred to as polyunsaturated fatty acids, or PUFAs, and these are very susceptible to oxidative attack. So any of those free radicals hanging around can attack those saturated fatty acids in our phospholipids in our cell membrane. And so with vitamin E hanging around, it's donating electrons to these free radicals and helping to make the cell membrane more stable. Vitamin E is also important in areas that are exposed to increased levels of oxygen, such as the red blood cells and the lungs. And remember that oxygen can eventually become a free radical and so it can create damage to red blood cells and damage to the lungs. So this is just showing you the potential of the phospholipids, and here are the fatty acid chains here, and those can be compromised, destroyed by free radicals. And so having vitamin E around helps to neutralize those free radicals and maintain that phospholipid bilayer. So function of vitamin E, uh, first one would be it is a good antioxidant. And like I said, it's helping to prevent those polyunsaturated fatty acids in the cell membrane from breaking down. Okay, so the free radicals, what they're doing is they destabilize the membrane, they alter cellular function, and the vitamin E donates electrons to get rid of those free radicals.
Another function of vitamin E is the prevention of plaque formation, and this is due to the ability of vitamin E to prevent the low-density lipoproteins floating around in the bloodstream from oxidation. So let's talk about that a little bit more. So oxidation of low-density lipoproteins is going to occur because of free radicals. So when normal LDL cholesterol is damaged, it's damaged by interacting with these free radicals that are floating around in the blood. And these free radicals are causing what we would call oxidation. And that destabilizes this LDL molecule of cholesterol. And the oxidized LDL then becomes very reactive with surrounding tissues and it can produce inflammation that eventually leads to disease and this disease that this oxidized LDL is creating in the blood is atherosclerosis so the LDL cholesterol in the endothelial lining of the arteries is going to increase accumulation of white blood cells and other immune cells such as dendritic cells and then macrophage which can create the inflammatory response in these blood vessels and then that causes platelets to start sticking and the platelets are sticking to the areas of inflammation within the arteries and now you start to get these platelets creating hardening of those arteries or that plaque in the blood vessels leading to atherosclerosis. So preventing oxidation of low-density lipoproteins is extremely important. And one of the chemicals that we eat that actually helps us to decrease oxidation would be our vitamins that are our anti-free radical vitamins such as vitamin E. Um, but if we eat too much processed sugar, this increases oxidation of LDLs. So another function of vitamin E is thought to help to prevent cataracts. And if you remember, cataracts are the hardening and the cloudiness that occurs in the lens of the eye and this is from oxidative damage and that oxidative damage can come from various things even including ultraviolet light. So vitamin E, okay, we know this is an antioxidant, we've kind of talked about this before with vitamin A uh, and it happens the same way. So you have oxygen and oxygen on occasion through the electron transport chain is going to gain an extra electron and become a free radical. So in order to gain stability, this free radical is going to attack uh, any nearby molecules such as lipids or proteins and steal an electron from them. Now when that electron goes to the oxygen, so it has its pair, it becomes stable, now you have a new molecule like a protein or a lipid that is unstable and becomes a free radical. And that free radical then tries to steal an electron from another molecule and it tries to become stable and you produce another free radical and in doing so you can cause widespread damage throughout the cell. Now if you have vitamin E around as an antioxidant, this can neutralize things very quickly because it donates its own electrons. And by donating its electrons, it is then uh, causing that free radical to now become stable. And vitamin E, vitamin C, they have the ability to do that. So here's some of the different sources of vitamin E. We can get this from uh, seeds and we can get this from nuts and from various different vegetables and then animal sources like uh, cod liver oil. Dairy doesn't have any very significant amounts of vitamin E, however. How vitamin E is measured in supplements, so we have the recommended daily allowance, which is about 15 milligrams, okay? 
and it can be given in international units rather than milligrams. Naturally, um, it has a higher activity than the synthetic form. When you're looking at these, you're looking at, for instance, this is the D-alpha, which is uh, the tocopherol, okay, in the vitamin E supplement. So vitamin E deficiencies, the populations that are at risk would be like smokers. And the reason for that is because smokers produce very high levels of free radicals. And so they're going to use up their vitamin E very quickly. Okay. Uh, however, mega doses taking this is not a good idea. People on low fat diets or have problems such as celiac disease or they have fat malabsorption, they're going to have vitamin E deficiencies also. And that's because um, vitamin E is fat soluble. And so they need this fat uh, in their diet and in order to be able to absorb the vitamin E into the bloodstream, it has to be done through the fat. Uh, this can also be a problem in preterm infants because there's a decreased transfer of vitamin E from the mom uh, because most of this is going to occur in late pregnancy. Now, some studies have suggested that vitamin E could also help in uh, slowing down the problems with Alzheimer's disease, lower blood pressure, uh, protect tissue from other destructive uh, oxidants as well. All right, so deficiencies in vitamin E can lead to what is referred to as hemolytic anemia. And hemolytic anemia is where the red blood cells of our body are destroyed faster than they're made. So when you're looking in somebody's blood, instead of just seeing these nice normal red blood cells, you'll see red blood cells and then you see little fragments of red blood cells because these red blood cells have gone through hemolysis. And this could be inherited, it could be acquired. Um, hemolysis occurs in preterm infants also because they didn't receive enough vitamin E from their mother. And then preemie formulas and supplements uh, typically will compensate for increased need of vitamin E. Now you can get vitamin E from animal products, but only plants synthesize the vitamin E. So the animals are eating the plants and getting their vitamin E from the plants as well. They don't actually synthesize vitamin E. They're like us. We have to eat the plants in order to get that vitamin E. The recommended daily allowance for adults is about 15 milligrams per day of the alpha tocopherol. And then here are some other good sources of vitamin E, salad oils, shortening, nuts and seeds. So vitamin E and cardiovascular disease um, go hand in hand. And what I mean by that is vitamin E has been shown in many studies to be associated with lower levels of cardiovascular disease in people. And uh, the FDA has said, no, you can't say that vitamin E is going to lower heart disease or even it's been shown to have a an effect on rates of cancer, um, but because vitamin E is a powerful antioxidant, it's helping to decrease that LDL oxidation and so therefore uh, lower cardiovascular disease. Too much vitamin E, obviously stored in fat in the liver, and this is not good. The upper limit is 1,000 milligrams per day. It interferes with vitamin K, which helps us as far as uh, blood clotting is concerned. If you don't have vitamin K, you're going to have hemorrhaging, and that even means hemorrhaging in the brain, which could lead to stroke, prolonged bloody noses are a symptom of lack of vitamin E, uh, and this is also a problem in people who are already taking blood thinners because this makes the blood even more thin. Uh, too much vitamin E can cause nausea, gas, diarrhea as well. Okay, so the last portion that we're going to go through are two minerals that are very important to the immune system, and that would be selenium and zinc. So selenium is a trace mineral, and again, that means that it 
isn't in uh, large quantities in the body but it is readily absorbable into our body and we need selenium for quite a few things for instance selenium aids in the activity of a natural antioxidant enzyme called glutathione peroxidase and glutathione peroxidase helps us to break down hydrogen peroxide which hydrogen peroxide can be very damaging to the cells in a number of ways. Selenium also spares vitamin E so that it can do its antioxidant thing and helps to maintain cell membrane integrity. It's also composed of an essential enzyme in the thyroid that helps us to produce T3 or the hormone triiodothyronine. So deficiency of selenium uh, has been associated with increased risk of prostate cancer. Also, not having enough selenium in the diet creates a problem with muscle pain and wasting, and that is any type of muscle. So not only skeletal muscle, but gastrointestinal intestinal muscles, um, so skeletal muscle, smooth muscle, cardiac muscle uh, can have a problem and uh, create wasting, something that is typically referred to as white muscle disease. So without enough selenium, what happens is eventually the muscle goes from a pinkish color to a whitish color, and then from a whitish color, it starts to waste away and become kind of liquidy and uh, not a good thing at all. Another thing is um, someone noticed that in China, in what's called the Qishan province, the soil, which is where we get selenium, is really, really low. And this results in something that is referred to as Qishan disease. Now, Qishan disease is a potentially fatal form of cardiomyopathy, which is where you see a breakdown of the cardiac muscle and leads to fibrosis of the muscle. And you can see where the muscle is dilated and turning a little bit white here. And this entire area is the actual ventricle and so it has hypertrophied and there are a lot of different things that can lead to cardiomyopathy but a deficiency in selenium is definitely one of them. Now, toxicity of selenium, uh, you don't need very much selenium a day so the upper level is about 400 micrograms per day and when you have too much selenium you get a garlicky kind of smelling breath. You also get hair loss, nausea, vomiting, weakness, rashes, even cirrhosis of the liver can occur. And this is also showing you cardiac myopathy. And some of our sources of selenium, Brazil nuts, fish, organ meats, shellfish, eggs. And again, we get selenium from the soil. The plants pull the selenium up and uh, it's absorbed into the plant and then we either eat the plant or we eat the animal that also ate the plant. So you have to have enough selenium in the soil uh, in order to be healthy. Some grains and seeds also are able to grow in selenium rich soil so you're able to get selenium from them as well. The recommended daily allowance of selenium is about 55 micrograms per day for adults. All right, so zinc is another essential nutrient. Uh, it is better absorption from animal sources. Deficiencies cause growth retardation and poor sexual development. So we're going to talk about that. Absorption of zinc is influenced by the foods we eat. 40% of zinc comes from animal sources and is absorbed by our body. Uh, it's dependent on what the body needs, how much you're going to absorb. Now, if you are consuming phytic acid while you're also consuming zinc, you have decrease in absorption capabilities. And that actually occurs with several different types of minerals such as copper and iron as well as zinc. And phytic acid comes from seeds. And some people even recommend that you should never eat anything that has phytic acid in it because it's considered what we would call a non-nutrient and it present, prevents absorption of other good nutrients for us. 
Uh, calcium supplements also decrease zinc absorption, so you shouldn't take the two of them together. It competes with copper and iron absorption also, so probably best not to take those all together. So another function of zinc in the immune system is also making white blood cells, making sure that they function normally. Zinc also helps us with DNA synthesis, protein metabolism, wound healing, and growth, and development of sex organs and bones. Zinc storage uh, helps with storage, release, and function of insulin as well, and can also help with cell membrane structure and function. So zinc is very important as far as cellular metabolism is concerned. It's an indirect antioxidant, too. Uh, zinc is a component of an enzyme called superoxide dismutase, and this is an enzyme that aids in prevention of oxidative damage to our cells. So here's a picture showing a 16-year-old boy in Egypt who was very zinc deficient and he is only 49 inches tall. So he not only had growth deficiencies, but his sexual organs also did not mature. Some significant sources of zinc in our diet would be protein-containing foods like red meat, and then also shellfish, and then whole grains. So recommended daily allowance for zinc is about 11 milligrams for men, 8 milligrams for women per day, and the upper level is uh, 40 milligrams per day. So this is kind of interesting. These little white spots are a really good sign of zinc deficiency. And then this is the tongue. You see the little spots on the tongue as well? So growth retardation, slow sexual maturity, loss of taste, lethargy, emotional disorders, slow wound healing, all problems of decreases in zinc. Zinc toxicity reduces high uh, density lipoprotein levels in the blood and increases our risk of heart disease because of it. And then diarrhea, cramps, nausea, vomiting, and depressed immune function. So don't exceed more than 100 milligrams per day without medical supervision. And you think, well, that's quite a lot of zinc, um, but people are taking zinc tablets for sore throat and cold, so it's a lot easier to go above the recommended levels and to get zinc toxicity now more than ever. All right, so that is the end of our video. And boy, that all looks really yummy. See you next time. Bye.